Oral questions. Questions orales. The honourable member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, I am again rising in the House today to provide the Prime Minister the opportunity to give Canadians the date by which he'll be balancing the budget. He made many commitments throughout the past number of years indicating that he would return the budget to balance in 2019. Canadians relied upon that in casting their ballot, and they've been proven to be taken for granted. Will the Prime Minister take the chance now and indicate when will the budget be balanced? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, no government in Canadian history ever added more to our national debt than the Conservatives of Stephen Harper. That is a fact, Mr. Speaker. And after 10 years of Stephen Harper, Canadians made a different choice, a better choice, a choice by a government that was there to invest in them, invest in their communities, grow the economy uh, the way we have so that the employment, unemployment is at its lowest in 40 years uh, and our growth was the strongest in the G7 last year. Mr. Speaker, we are investing in Canadians and their future. The Conservatives don't have a plan. A member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, this government doesn't have a clue, quite frankly. The reality is that it's incredibly important to have a budget that's balanced in order to withstand any future issues. The Prime Minister recognized that this was a selling feature for Canadians. He himself said in his own Liberal platform, after the next two fiscal years, the deficit will decline and we will return to a balanced budget in 2019. Mr. Speaker, I will give the Prime Minister another chance. Will he tell us when they will balance the budget? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, for 10 years, the Conservatives racked up deficit after deficit after deficit after deficit. Mr. Speaker, well, we made a commitment to invest in Canadians and. Order. Order. Members on all sides are able to sit through a question period, most, most members on all sides, without reacting to what they hear and don't like. And one can expect to hear things they don't like during question period. And the rest should remember that they have to wait their turn before speaking. The Honourable Member for the Honourable Prime, the Honourable Prime Minister has the floor. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives still stubbornly don't get it. Every year we decrease the debt to GDP ratio while at the same time grow the economy and create jobs for Canadians. We are living up to the commitments we made to Canadians. They are stuck in Stephen Harper's past. Member for Milton. It is true, Mr. Speaker, we are stuck on the fact that Canadians were told that the budget would be balanced in 2019, and yeah. we're here to ask questions of the government. Exactly. And if we're stubborn, then the arrogance being displayed by this exactly. Prime Minister with respect to breaking promises to Canadians is absolutely shameful. Yeah. The reality is what he said several times, including to Mr. Mulcair, in a debate was, Mr. Mulcair, I'm looking straight at Canadians and being honest the way I always have. We said we are committed to balance budgets, and we are. We will balance that budget in 2019. Order. The right Honourable Prime Minister. Order, Speaker. I'm always happy to have an opportunity to remember the 2015 election campaign where Canadians were given a clear choice of a government that was willing to cut to balance the budget at all costs uh, versus a Liberal Party that was willing to invest in Canadians to grow the economy in ways that they hadn't been able to uh, over the longest time. Under Conservatives, wages were stagnant. Under our government, wages are rising at a rate of 3 per cent. Under Conservatives, GDP growth was 1 per cent. Under our our government GDP growth three percent. Mr. Speaker, we are delivered. Order. The honourable member for St. Albert Edmonton seems to think that he can speak and even bellow in this place without being called upon. I'd consider. I'd ask him to reconsider that opinion, or else he won't be speaking for a while. The Honourable Member for Richemont, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, here are the facts. On page 12 of the Liberal 
election platform, it says, our investment plan will allow us to return to a balanced budget in 2019. It's November 21st, 2018, and the deficit, the accumulated deficit, is at $80 billion. Who's going to pay for this? Our children and grandchildren. My question is simple. Can the Prime Minister stand in this place and tell us when will we return to a balanced budget? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased that the Honourable Member is talking about children and grandchildren because in Richemont, Artabasca, we're helping 20,400 uh, 20, children with the Canada Child Benefit. Six million, six and a half million dollars every month in his riding, child, the child tax benefit. We're helping families Canada wide, and we are uh, creating the economic growth they never could. The Honourable Member for Richemont Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, here are the facts. While this government has been spending Canadians' money, money they've worked hard for, our energy se uh, sector is struggling. The Liberals are driving foreign investors away. Businesses are less competitive because of bad tax reform. And the truth is that 80 percent of Canadians pay more tax today than three years ago. So again, the question is simple. When are we going to restore our economy's budget balance? $6.4 million every month in his riding of Richemont Artabasca to help more than 20,000 children. We do this every month. We are investing in Canadians in their future by investing in public transit, in uh, aid to business people, to families, to our seniors. We are creating the economic growth they could never deliver. We are investing in Canadians, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Rimouski, Nijet Timiskwata, Basque. From 2015, the Harper Conservatives have rolled back many fundamental labour rights that affect workers' ability to organise freely, bargain collectively in good faith, and work in a safe environment. Mr. Speaker, this was said by none other than the Prime Minister during a campaign back in 2015, the same Prime Minister whose government is now musing about legislating workers back to work. Why doesn't he realise that his actions are the ones that are embalming Canada Post executives do not bargain in good faith. Right. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have faith in the collective bargaining process and believe that the best deals are reached at the table. For nearly a year, we've been supporting and encouraging both sides to reach a negotiated agreement. We've provided conciliation officers, appointed mediators, and offered voluntary arbitration. Legislation is not a step that we take lightly. We reappointed the special mediator to work with the parties over the next two days to reach an agreement. We encourage both sides to reach a deal, but we are prepared to act if there is no significant progress. The Honourable Member it says that without laughing. You know, si j'étais progressiste. If I was a progressive on the Liberal benches, I'd be asking some pretty serious questions about how I could support legislation that would take away any balance of power between workers and management, that would allow uh, Canada Post to not negotiate in good faith, and which would show that they were ready to do anything to please giants like Amazon and eBay. Where, where are the fine words of the Prime Minister when it comes time to, to bargain fairly? Where is his backbone when it comes to demanding the Canada Post negotiate fairly, the Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, we believe profoundly in collective bargaining, and we are convinced that the best agreements come at the bargaining table, the negotiating table. We are encouraging both parties to bargain and to come to an agreement. We do not take legislation lightly. We will want, we hired uh, an arbitrator to work with both parties. We hope that they will come to an agreement, but we are ready to act if necessary. The Honourable Member for Jean-Claire, Mr. Speaker, 
the accumulation of mail that Canada Post is talking about is really exaggerated. In Toronto, there are 70 trailers of mail and not hundreds, as Canada Post claims. There are six in Hamilton, two in Halifax, 15 in Moncton, and all this can be delivered in a few days. Canada Post is creating an artificial crisis and the government is taking the bait. Why doesn't the Labour Minister protect workers' security? Why? Is the government siding with management rather than with postal workers? The honourable, right honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we have been working in partnership with unions countrywide to show that a government can respect them and can consider that they are essential for the growth of the middle class and for those uh, aspiring to join it. We respect unions. We have always worked with unions. We know that the best way to deal with um, differences is at the uh, bargaining table. We hope that we will come to an agreement. We hope they come to an agreement, but we're ready to act if they don't. Mr. Speaker, despite it being unconstitutional, the Liberals placed back-to-work legislation on notice yesterday, thereby destroying any incentive for Canada Post to negotiate seriously. The Prime Minister rationalizes this by saying Christmas and important shopping days are coming. What message is he giving to thousands of COPW workers whose physical health, mental health and families are compromised because Canada Post refuses to negotiate fairly? Mr. Speaker, how is this Prime Minister any different from Stephen Harper? Here, here. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have transformed the relationship between the Government of Canada and organized labour across this country. We have engaged in a thoughtful, positive way. I've been proud to attend uh, many, many meetings uh, with a broad range of labour groups, labor groups over the past years. We continue to build on this important partnership, important for us, important for labour, and important for Canadians as well, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to respect and work with organized labour. We will continue to ensure that there is every opportunity to solve these challenges at the bargaining table, which is the right place for them. But we are, Mr. Speaker, ready to act if necessary. The Honourable Member for Dewey saint -Laurent. Mr. Speaker, three and a half years, the Liberal leader came up with a really novel economic theory, and I quote, as you know, a budget will balance itself. I don't think there's anyone in the world who would have really adopted this theory, and for reason. Now, over the last three years, he was able to practice this budget balance. So when will the budget when will the budget be balanced the right honorable prime minister mr speaker we have no lessons to learn from the previous conservative government who added more who added billions of dollars to our national debt than any other government more than any other government in the history of canada deficit after deficit when they governed and the worst mr mr speaker very little growth uh, of the economy, very little job creation. We have invested in Canadians, in communities. We've created jobs, economic growth. Our plan is working to help the middle class. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, no one on planet Earth will, has, will believe the theory. The budget will balance itself. So it was supposed to be $10 billion the first year, but it, now it's, then it was $18 billion. Second year, $10 billion, and then $17 billion. But they swore on their honour that in 2019 they would return to a balanced budget. We're not to, too far from there. When will the budget be balanced? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, our approach is the complete contrary of the Conservative previous Conservative governments. They gave benefits, advantages to the richest. We are investing in the middle class. So we are helping children, families, our uh, seniors, business people. We have brought down tax on businesses. We are investing in the middle class, and this is working to create economic growth. They have no plan to uh, create economic growth.
he goes again insulting the people on whom he wants to raise taxes. Of course, he said that soccer moms and hockey dads were too rich, and that's why he needed to take away their children's fitness tax credits. He said farmers and small business owners were rich, rich tax cheats, and that's why he needed to, to attack them, meanwhile protecting his own trust fund and the family business of the finance minister. Despite all of the revenue windfall from his higher taxes, the deficit is three times what he promised this year. Will he tell us in what year will the budget be balanced? Honourable Prime Minister. Over $4 million a month. That's how much money this government is sending to the riding of Carleton for kids in that riding, over 17,000 kids who receive more money every year uh, than uh, they did under the Conservative government. Why didn't he invest uh, in the families in his riding? We're seeing record levels of growth across this country. We're seeing record low levels of unemployment. We are investing in Canadians' future, and our plan is working, Mr. Speaker. While they continue to try and pretend that deficits uh, are, uh, are something they have no experience with. Order. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, Mr. Speaker, when we introduced the child care benefit, we had a balanced budget. And when we boosted the child care benefit, we had a, we had a balanced budget. And furthermore, we did so without raising anyone's taxes. He targeted middle class families with higher taxes, which has generated more money for the government to spend. And spend he has, but he spent it all, and now he's spending more. The deficit is three times what he promised this year. And next year, when the budget was supposed to balance itself, we still see no end in sight. So, will he finally answer the question when will the budget balance itself? Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite talks about contrasting their approach to family benefits uh, to the Canada Child Benefit. Well, let's look at that. Their approach continued to send child benefit checks to millionaire families. We stopped sending it to wealthiest Canadians so we could give more to the ones who actually needed the, the approach. Uh, the other thing is they made their child benefits taxable, so families would spend every month and then have to give back to the government at the end of the year. That made no sense. Our proactive, means-tested Canada Child Benefit is lifting hundreds of thousands of kids out of poverty. The honourable member for Carleton. The only millionaire that's getting taxpayer-funded child care benefits is this Prime Minister, sitting right in front of us, who gives himself tens of thousands of dollars a year in free nanny services that every other Canadian has to pay for out of their own pocket. Those families understand, because they know how to balance their family budgets, that budgets don't balance themselves. Yeah. This Prime Minister has never had to worry about money, so he doesn't worry about Canadians' money. Yeah. Well, Canadians are worried. Tell them when will the budget be balanced. Yeah. Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, this from a member of a Conservative government that added more billions of dollars to the national debt than any other government in Canadian history. And what did they have to show for it? The worst record on growth since R.B. Bennett in the depths of the Great Depression, Mr. Speaker. What have we done? We've invested in Canadians the way we promised to in the last election. We've invested in infrastructure. We've given more money to families who need it. And it has delivered real growth for the Canadian economy, growth in wages, growth in jobs. We are delivering what we committed to Canadians. Honourable Member for Carleton. Actually, the previous Conservative government paid off over $30 billion of debt before the great global recession drove all G7 countries into deficit. And throughout, Liberals said, spend more, spend faster, you could never spend enough. We ignored them, and as a result, we balanced the budget, led the G7 in growth and in job creation, and had the best economic performance of all our peers. Prime Minister. After and adding record amounts to the national debt, after running deficit after deficit after deficit after deficit after deficit, after deficit they finally created a phony balance just in time for the election. And how did they do it? 
on the backs of our veterans, nickel and diming and shutting down veterans service officers. They did it by ramming through changes to the Phoenix pay system uh, when booking those changes in advance. They phonied up a budget so they could try and run on it. They don't know how to manage a budget, and the record is proof of that. Order, please. The Honourable Member for Drummond, order, please. Mr. Speaker, Doug Ford's decision to cut the position of Commissioner for French Language Services and abandon the idea of a Francophone university in Ontario created a shockwave across Canada. The Prime Minister says he's disappointed and concerned, but what he should do is act. The Liberals are, are saying that they're there for Franco-Ontarians. What are they going to do? What will they do? Will he call, call Doug Ford and ask him to back off, as the NDP is asking the Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker? I'm happy to tell the House that our minister, or the, the minister for official languages, will be calling her counterpart and talk about these cuts that are very unfortunate. We feel that official uh, language status is important across the country. We have always supported a minority language communities. We encourage every member of this House to push the uh, Ford government to change direction. For Timmins, James Bay. Mr. President, Doug. Mr. Speaker, Doug Ford and the Conservative Party have shown just how ignorant they are about the history of resistance and the history of the fight for the rights of Franco-Ontarian communities. The attack against the French language university is an attack on the rights of Francophones everywhere in Canada. Will the Prime Minister call Doug Ford directly and defend this institution and guarantee federal funding to develop a French language university in Ontario. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker. Now, I can't think of the defence of Franco-Ontarian rights without thinking of our dear colleague Mohid Béranger, who was such a defender of Franco-Ontarian rights and language minority rights. If he were here today, he would be the first to defend the rights of Francophones. And we are as one with him in defending the rights of Francophones for defending French language minorities against conservative cuts. The Honourable Member for Pontiff, Jacques Cartier. Mr. Speaker, the legislation is clear. The chief statistician is supposed to inform his minister of any changes, and yet the Minister of Innovation said he learned about the intrusion into Canadian bank accounts from the media. Will the Prime Minister act and give instructions to his minister so that he abides by legislation? Will the government commit to stopping this harvesting of their personal data. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we take Canadians' privacy very seriously, just as StatsCan does. StatsCan communicated with the uh, Commissioner. We also want reliable data for Canadians. Conservatives acted just according to their ideology. We saw the consequences a record low growth rate. We will protect Canadians' privacy, and we will come up with policies based on real data. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, the government is sticking its nose into the personal data of thousands of honest Canadians, and I would like the government to make sure that, as citizens, be aware of this. Will this Prime Minister do everything he can to protect the privacy of Canadians? When will the Prime Minister stop this project, this harvesting of Canadians' personal data? 
The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have always protected Canadians' privacy. That's why we're working with the Privacy Commissioner to make sure that all data are collected properly. And with respect to this pilot project, we will make sure that uh, confidential data, private data, are protected. Now, Conservatives say that they're concerned about pri privacy, but Canadians can see through this. Recently, the leader of the opposition in the House told me that the Conservatives are still opposed to the long-form census. Mr. Speaker, we will do better. Mr. Speaker, let's recap. A letter was sent from StatsCan to the banks ordering them to provide the personal financial information of Canadians. This letter went out before any notification was made or any plans were made public. StatsCan appears to have broken the law, and this Prime Minister needs to step in and fix it. Will the Prime Minister fix this mess and cancel this program? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we take the privacy of Canadians very seriously, and we expect Stats Canada to as well. In fact, Statistics Canada has been engaged with the Privacy Commissioner in regards to this pilot project, which has not yet been launched. We also understand the importance of quality and reliable data to Canadians. During 10 years, Conservatives ignored data and governed only through ideology. We witnessed the consequences historically low economic growth while they were in power. We will continue to protect the privacy of Canadians and promote evidence-based policy. Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Similkameen Nicholas. Mr. Speaker, he says we're ignoring the data, or, but the fact is he's ignoring the question. The law says that the minister must be told of any mandatory requests for data by Statistics Canada 30 days before it's made. It also says that any new request must be made public. According to the minister, he found out about this scheme to surveil Canadians from media reports. It looks as if stats can violated the law. Will this prime minister finally listen to the concerns of Canadians and cancel this unauthorized scheme? Right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, we've heard this approach before from the Conservatives. It's the same kinds of fear-mongering and politicization they use uh, in order to justify their cancellation of the long-form census. We can understand uh, how important it is to protect Canadians' privacy. We work with the Privacy Commissioner to ensure that Stats Canada uh, always complies and protects Canadians' privacy. But this war on data, this war on facts that continues, uh, that continues to come from the Conservatives, well, it was rejected in 2015, Mr. Speaker, and I know Canadians are going to reject it again. That's right. Order. The Honourable Member for churchill kiwetnook asking. Mr. Speaker, today the international community criticized Canada for human rights violations. The UN Committee Against Torture made it clear that the forced sterilization of Indigenous women constitutes torture. Wow. The committee also demanded an explanation for the lack of reparations and sanctions. Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. This is what genocide looks like. How could Canada let this happen on our watch? So will the Prime Minister take immediate action, put a stop to this horrific act, and bring justice to the Indigenous women and their families who were violated? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the coerced sterilization of some Indigenous women is a serious violation of human rights. We know that Indigenous patients can face systemic barriers in accessing services, including discrimination and racism. We all have a role to play to ensure that Indigenous patients receive quality health care free of prejudice, including ensuring health workers receive cultural competency training as laid out in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action. We will continue working with partners to ensure all Indigenous peoples have access to culturally safe health services no matter where they live in Canada. The Honourable Member for Laurier Sainte Marie. Mr. Speaker, Germany has stopped to selling arms to Saudi Arabia. That is leadership. But here, about a month ago, the Prime Minister announced that the government was reviewing existing export permits, not future ones, current ones. So could the Prime Minister inform the House on the status of this review of current 
arms export permits to Saudi Arabia and tell us when we can expect a decision. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we demand and, and ensure that uh, products exported from Canada are used in accordance with human rights. That is why we are reviewing and have a rigorous uh, export uh, s permit system. As I said, we are looking at existing uh, permits uh, for Saudi Arabia. The Honourable Member. Mr. Speaker, there is excellent uh, no news because we have uh, Viola Desmond on the new $10 bill. I was very happy to see the members of uh, the community in my writing put uh, together a play on this issue. Can the Prime Minister inform the House of the date when Canadians can expect to see these new bills in circulation? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Honourable Member for his hard work and for the question. Two years ago, we announced that a Canadian woman would be on a bank bill in regular circulation. Following consultations across the country, we were proud to announce that Viola Desmond would be on the new $10 bill. Since earlier this week, the $10 bill has been in circulation, so all Canadians can find Viola on a bill in their wallets, uh, and we should all be very proud of that. The Honourable Member for Chikudmi Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, the Australian F-18s will be a burden on the Royal Canadian Air Force and all Canadians, all taxpayers. The Liberals invented the capability gap. It never existed. According to the Auditor General, the Liberal plan to buy Australian F-18s, the used ones, will have a minimal impact on uh, the Air Force fighter jet program. When will the government cancel this unnecessary purchase? Mr. Speaker, first of all, I want to thank the Auditor General for the recommendations made. The report confirms what we always knew. Conservatives mismanaged the file and misled Canadians. The report confirms the existence of a capability gap created under the Conservatives. We will not jeopardize our ability to honor our commitments to NORAD and NATO. That is why we launched an open, transparent competition with a view to replacing the aging CF-18 fleet, something the Conservatives didn't succeed to do in a decade. Kirk Interlake Eastman. Well, Mr. Speaker, no one believes this, Prime Minister, for a second. This is the guy that pulled our CF-18s out of the fight against ISIS and now wants to fly them around like we're dealing with a Cuban missile crisis. The Auditor General trashed this, this Prime Minister's fighter jet plan. Instead of following the Auditor General's recommendations and scrapping his outrageous plan to buy old, obsolete Aussie jets, the Prime Minister betrayed our Air Force by rushing out to finalize the deal. Will the Prime Minister stop spending billions Billion. to keep our aging fighter fleet on life support, cancel this asinine Australian deal? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Auditor General for his important recommendations, which actually confirm what we have always known. The Conservatives mismanaged the Jets file and misled Canadians for more than a decade. The report confirms the existence of a capability gap which started under the Harper Conservatives. Unlike the Conservatives, we will not compromise our ability to meet our NATO and NORAD commitments. That is why we launched an open and transparent competition to replace the aging CF-18s, something the Conservatives couldn't get done in a decade. A member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, Canadians must have confidence in the security of the nation. To earn that confidence, the government must reassure Canadians that the highest authorities in the country, ministers of cabinet, protect the information with which they are entrusted. And Canadians need to know when that trust has been breached. Will the Prime Minister confirm that no members of the current or previous cabinet have unlawfully released cabinet confidence oh. information. Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for her question. As she well knows, because this is an issue of a current ongoing court case, it would be inappropriate for me to comment. The Honourable Member for Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. I wasn't Hill. commenting on an ongoing information. I was asking a very important question of this Prime Minister. Canadians need to know that the secrets of the nation are protected at the highest levels and that the Prime Minister will react swiftly and appropriately when Canada's security has been compromised. Yeah. Did a current or former cabinet minister unlawfully release cabinet confidence information? Hey. Hey. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as the member opposite well knows, uh, these exact questions are at the centre of an ongoing court case. Uh, we respect the independence of the judiciary on this side of the House. Uh, we will ensure uh, that we continue to respect that by not commenting on this ongoing court case. Hello. Order. Order. L'honorable député de Sherbrooke. The honourable member for Sherbrooke. Mr. Speaker, for three years, the Prime Minister has been repeating that they're working to implement a fairer and more equitable tax system. However, the Auditor General's report revealed that a revenue agency shows more clemency towards rich multinationals and those involved in dubious transactions, and it does ordinary people. What a surprise. The Liberals are continuing to maintain a two-year tax system that favours very rich people at the expense of others. Will, will the Prime Minister acknowledge that the promises have not been kept and that the Auditor General has stated that they have failed across the board in this area? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we thank the Auditor General for his report. We are resolved. All Canadians will be tr are treated fairly and will pay their fair share. The Revenue Agency will look at its internal processes to ensure the uniformity of work done in this area. Since we took power, the agency has doubled the number of audits abroad than under the previous Conservative government. Thanks to our investments, the agency now takes action against uh, people involved in tax uh, evasion and people are suffering the consequences of that. Immigration has left families and caregivers in the dark for months on what will replace the current caregiver program. This week, migrant workers' rights groups released a report calling on the minister to ensure caregivers are finally given the respect and security they deserve. Experts and caregivers have been clear for decades. If you're good enough to work here, you're good enough to stay. No more delay tactics. Will the Prime Minister do what is right and commit to providing caregivers permanent resident status on arrival? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are proud of the improvements and reforms we've made to the immigration system to make it fairer, to make it better, respect the rights and protect the rights uh, of anyone coming to Canada. We recognize that there's more work to do, but we also need to make sure that we are maintaining the confidence that Canadians have in our immigration system. That is why our immigration minister is working so hard with a broad range of immigration and adv advocacy groups to respond to their concerns, to make Canada's immigration system continue to be the example to the world that it is. Honorable Député de Charles. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Old Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, borders exist for a reason. They keep Canadians safe and promote orderly planned migration. The Conservatives are opposed to Canada signing the UN Global Pact on Migration because the Prime Minister has allowed some 38,000 people to illegally enter Canada from the U.S thereby degrading our borders and asylum system. Will the Prime Minister commit to, to fixing this agreement with the uh, safe third country, and will it withdraw from the UN Global Pact on Migration? The Honourable Prime Minister. No, Mr. Speaker, we will not be withdrawing from the UN Global Pact on Immigration. It's essential to continue to show respect for Immigration, our understanding that immigration and accepting refugees must uh, be done. We are a country that has been built on accepting people who came here to build a better life. We have a 
population that supports immigration because they know that we have a robust and safe system. Even with irregular cr crossings, we continue uh, to enforce our immigration policies. Yeah. Except people who have reached the safety of upstate New York are not the world's most vulnerable people, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The UN Global Compact on Migration directs the countries to, quote, sensitize media on what to say with regard to immigration. Now, and given that this Prime Minister disparages name calls, bullies, anyone who dares to question his severe inability to manage Canada's borders or manage the integrity of our asylum system, Conservatives oppose the signing of this agreement. Will the, minister, will the Prime Minister withdraw Canada from this agreement and close the loophole in the Safe Third Country Agreement? Mr. Speaker, the world is seeing unprecedented levels of men, women and children displaced by war and by persecution. Our government is proud to have taken a leadership role on the Global Compact. This is the first time the international community has worked together to develop a comprehensive set of principles to better manage this phenomenon. It is disappointing to see the Conservatives engage in peddling rebel media conspiracy theories while we work with the international community to protect our robust immigration system. Honourable Member for Calgary Rocky Ridge. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General confirmed what Canadians have known for years, that tax rules aren't applied fairly. He said, quote, the Canada Revenue Agency did not consistently apply tax rules, even though the taxpayer's Bill of Rights includes the right to have the law applied consistently, end quote. The report also said that those with offshore transactions were given special breaks that are denied to ordinary Canadians. Why are there one set of rules for regular Canadians and another set of rules for people like the Prime Minister's rich Liberal friends? Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we thank the Auditor General for this report. We're committed to ensuring that all Canadians are treated fairly and that they all pay their fair share. The CRA will review internal processes, definitions and procedures to ensure that compliance work is consistent. It's interesting to note that the Auditor General's report also covered the last years of the Conservative Party in office, and that's why since we took office, the CRA has completed twice as many offshore compliance audits than under the Conservatives. And thanks to our unprecedented investments, the CRA can now identify those involved in tax evasion and aggressive avoidance and ensure they face consequences better than they did under the Conservative government. The Honourable Member of Alfred Pellon. Mr. Speaker, our aerospace sector provides good quality jobs for the middle class and innovations that improve the quality of life for Canadians. More than 100,000 aerospace companies and organizations contribute $2.3 billion to the economy and employ some 10,000 Canadians. A clean environment and a strong economy go hand in hand, and satellite images are a, a part of that part of Canada's uh, fight against climate change. Can the Prime Minister inform the House of the government's uh, investments in the future of uh, this type of technology? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I'd like to thank the member for Alfred Pénon for his work and for his uh, support for these industries in his region. We are proud to announce some $13 million to North Star Earth and Space. The funds will enable North Star to revolutionize the way we see the world. Better satellite images will, make it, will improve weather forecasts, monitoring in the event of industrial or ecological disasters. North Star is a stimulating example of an innovative Canadian startup and our investment will continue to maintain Quebec's place in the forefront of cutting-edge technology. For Sarnia Lampton. Mr. Speaker, the safety of the food that Canadians eat should be a top priority for any government. Cases of E. coli have been occurring for over a month in Canada by people who consume romaine lettuce. Just now, the Centre for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States has ordered grocery stores to pull this contaminated product. It took over a month for the Liberals just to inform Canadians that the lettuce they're eating might not be safe. Why haven't the Liberals issued a recall to protest or to protect the Canadians? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, protecting the health and safety of Canadians is our government's top priority. We are collaborating with provincial health authorities as well as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the FDA in the United States to investigate the outbreak of E. coli infections linked to romaine lettuce in Ontario and Quebec. People in Ontario and Quebec should avoid eating romaine lettuce and salad mixes containing romaine lettuce until the cause of contamination is known. We will continue to keep Canadians informed as new information becomes available. The Honourable Member for Mr. Speaker, 
When the Prime Minister came to my riding, several stakeholders told him directly just how important it was to maintain the night service at uh, the flight information station at uh, the Rouen airport, uh, even if NAVCAN recommended closing it. Now, the, prime, the Minister of Transport told us that a new he's requested a new study, but NAVCAN has uh, made its decision and is saying it's only holding additional consultations. Will the Prime Minister acknowledge this is a public safety matter and maintain night service at the airport? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I was very happy to go to Rouen-Nuranda and to hear directly from uh, people there. Safety in the transportation system is a pro top priority for our government. The minister and the department are working with NAVCAN on the issue, issue to ensure that operations at the airport are safe. No decision has been made, nor is it question of cancelling night flights. Since the glare is a good thing, I think. Honourable Member for Scarborough Centre. Mr. Speaker, I represent a riding where many constituents are working hard to join the middle class, but are finding it difficult. The cost of everything from food to rent continues to rise, and wages don't always keep pace. They need to make difficult choices every day. They work hard, but find it challenging to get ahead. Can the Prime Minister please explain how the government's poverty reduction strategy will help families like those in Scarborough Centre. Good and question. Right Honourable Prime Minister. I want to thank the member for Scarborough Centre for her hard work and for speaking up on behalf of Canadians working hard to join the middle class. We have invested $22 billion in the fight against poverty, and programs like the Canada Child Benefit and more generous benefits for seniors have helped lift 650,000 Canadians out of poverty. We know there's still more to do. We index the CCB. We're introducing the Canada Workers' Benefit and the Canada Housing Benefit, and we have a plan for achieving the lowest level of poverty in Canada's history. The Honourable Member of Mécanticlérable. Mr. Speaker, Can Canadians' health is being played with. This is the third time in a year that the public health agency has been calling for, uh, telling Canadians not to eat romaine lettuce. After twice, we should have been watching this. But we've learned that on the 18th or in October, uh, an E. coli outbreak had occurred, and it took over a month for the minister to issue a warning. Now. Why is it uh, in the U.S., in fact, they've recalled uh, lettuce? So why is uh, the Prime Minister here playing with this health of Canadians? Mr. Speaker, we will always protect uh, the health and safety of Canadians. We are collaborating with uh, provincial and territorial health uh, or safety, rather, uh, groups and the United States to determine the outbreak of E. coli. People in Ontario and Quebec should avoid eating romaine lettuce and salad mixes until the cause of the contamination is known. We will continue to keep Canadians informed of the situation. The Honourable Member for both. This government has been unable to solve the illegal migrants' crisis. It plans to increase by 40 per cent the number of immigrants we accept. And it is about to sign the Global Compact on Regular Migration a United Nations plan to make mass migration normal and easier. Will the Prime Minister tell us if he still believes that Canada is a sovereign country that must protect its border and its identity, yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada is extraordinarily fortunate to be one of the few places in the world these days whose citizens are, for the most part, positive towards immigration. Uh, we know that immigration is a source of strength and resilience, has indeed created this country uh, and its economic growth over the past year, uh, the past decades. We know that continuing to defend a strong immigration system that follows the rules, that imposes uh, our rules and our expectations is important to Canadians, and that is what we were doing. Whether people arrive regularly or irregularly, all the rules around our immigration system apply and are enforced. Yeah. 